Hi everyone, my name is Yashasvi Tiwari and today we are going to talk about chapter 3 of NISM 21A module which talks about investing in stocks. Now, when an investor is looking at investments, that investor might be looking at either debt or equity. And specifically, if we look at equity, a person, an investor would be looking at either making a capital appreciation through stock market or getting dividend income. Now, dividend payment depends on how the company is earning profits and capital appreciation depends on how the share market conditions and its peculiarities are. So, an uh, investor has to uh, uh, choose between debt and equity. If, let's say, an investor wants to go for lower risk and want to is willing to accept stable or lower stable returns, they might choose debt. However, if you have, if there is an investor who would want higher returns, that investor might be uh, want might want to take an additional risk of equity investments. So equity inherently is riskier if you compare it with bonds or any other asset classes. However, there are ways to reduce that risk. Most meaningful way to do risk reduction is through diversification. Now, diversification can be done cross-sectional as well as time series basis. What does it mean? So cross-sectional mean, let's say, um, an investor has been investing in a particular stock and that stock is getting impacted by certain internal factors. Whereas other stock, which is less correlated to that stock, would not is not getting impacted with those factors. So an investor can diversify from that stock to another stock. Overall, try to an investor try to will try to find out those uh, stocks or those portfolios which are less correlated. So if they are less correlated, it means this diversification will work. So one can diversify uh, sector specific, one can diversify stock specific. That's how the non-market risk can be diversified. So this is what cross-sectional diversification means, diversifying across uh, your sectors or stock specific or country specific. However, when we are talking about time specific diversification, it's about keeping yourself invested for a little longer period in time. So find taking the advantage or taking the benefits of time diversification is by investing in equities for a little longer period of time. So it's a belief that actually bad times will get cancelled out by good times. So this is why time in the market is suggested in equity investment versus timing the market. Now let's talk about what kind of risk might be there. So there are various types of risk associated with equity investments. We will talk about few major risks today. So the risk which we are talking about is uh, not are not all the risks, but main risk which we'll cover. So in that first one is the market risk and the most important risk in equity market. Ma what is market risk? It is because of the fluctuation which happens in the price of equity because of various market conditions that is called market risk. Now these the factors which is impacting prices in the market is in, in is actually impacting all investment irrespective of a particular sector or anything so therefore this risk cannot be diversified but it can be hedged how you will calculate the market risk it is calculated by beta other type of risk is sector specific risk so uh, sector specific is also non market risk it is not a market risk. It can be diversified since it is a non-market risk. So there are certain risk factors which might be impacting performance of a particular business or a particular sector. Whereas same factors might not be impacting other sector or other businesses. So that can be diversified. If you are diversifying across those two sectors which are non-correlated. Third type of risk is your company-specific risk. Company-specific risk is generally a non it's it's a non market risk it is because of the factors which is affecting performance of a particular company 
maybe those factors are not impacting other company so diversification is investing in different companies with where the factors are not impacting so fourth type of risk is liquidity risk now liquidity risk is about uh, it's about how quickly you can co convert your investments into cash without getting impacted too much how it is calculated we have spoken about liquidity risk in earlier chapters also it is measured by impact cost the impact cost is a price movement which is in percentage term because of a particular order size if there is a particular order size because of that a percentage price movement is there that is known as impact cost so in case of illiquid investments or less liquid stocks which are less traded a single trade a single large trade might impact the prices of the stock considerably however if there are stocks which are very good which are liquid stock which we call it liquid stock they might they will have lower impact cost and they will have lower liquidity risk other than equity shares there are another types of shares also these shares are known as preference shares now what are preference shares preference shares are actually uh, ranking above the equity shares if we look at the payment of dividends and distribution of company net asset in case of liquidation so these shares has equity characteristics as well as debt characteristics also when i talk about equity characteristics it means these shares uh, might not have voting rights but has a dividend feature attached to it which might be fixed in some cases whereas if i am talking about debt case it means the dividend payment is fixed so it has characteristics of equity as well as debt that's how sometimes it is also known as the hybrid security dividends of preference shares are either cumulative non cumulative participating non participating or might be a combination for example non cumulative non participating what is a cumulative preference preference share in a cumulative preference share the dividends which has not been given in the past will get accumulated and will be given in a future on a future date that are cumulative preference shares in a non cumulative preference share the past dividends which were not paid earlier will not be paid in future that is a non cumulative preference share so non participating preference share uh in which dividend are paid usually it is particular uh, usually at a fixed rate it is not depend dependent on a company's earning like in common shares it is dependent on a company earning it is a discretion of the management whether they want to give dividends or not but in this case it will be in a fixed rate that's why there is a characteristics of a debt instrument also preference share also convertible so there might be some pre decided conditions for a convertible preference share that it 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 might get converted into number of equity uh, shares on a particular at a particular specific time given a particular condition these preference shares might be converted into a equity share also other than this there are uh, dvrs as well in the market there are certain shares which has dvr differential voting rights so uh, in equity in common share you have voting rights that is a um, uh, that is part of common share however in a dvr there might be a superior voting right or inferior voting voting right so what is superior voting right in a common share one share is equal to one vote whereas in superior voting right one share might get multiple votes in a inferior voting rights one share might get a fraction of voting right so that is the characteristics of dvr stock differential voting right there are few of the stocks also available in indian stock market let's talk about equity research now equity research is important by because there are thousands of opportunities which are available for investors in the equity markets and stock selection process is very important in identifying those stocks which are in line with a client risk return and liquidity requirements 
So what does equity research means? It means that you uh, one is analyzing financials, non-financial information of a company, understanding dynamics of a company, understanding the competitors in the company, understanding economic conditions. Analyzing those things is known as equity research. Why do uh, one do an equity research such a way? After doing equity research, idea is to come up with an intrinsic value. Once you are uh, come up with an intrinsic value after doing equity research, then you compare it with the current market price. And then you compare it and decide whether you want to buy, hold or sell the stock. So uh, that's the uh, basic of equity research. Now in equity research, let's talk about fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis is the process of determining intrinsic value of the stock which also ideally equity research means. Now, uh, the intrinsic value of the stock is dependent on underlying economic factors. For example, the cash flows and the future earnings, which might be coming, interest rate, risk variables. By examining these factors, your intrinsic value is, intrinsic value of a stock is determined. So investor should actually buy a stock if the market price is below intrinsic value. Otherwise, either not to buy it or avoid or sell the stock. So uh, investors who are engaged in fundamental analysis, they believe that the intrinsic value is different than the current market price. And eventually the current market price will uh, and intrinsic value will merge. So that's, that's the basic idea of uh, investors or analysts who are doing fundamental analysis. Now there are uh, three types of analysis which is done in fundamental economy, industry and company that is known as EIC framework. So economy analysis, industry analysis and company analysis. And then valuation of a stock is calculated. There are two approaches to do that. So one approach is top down. Top down approach means an analyst will be first analyzing economic or macroeconomic factors then we'll identify uh, industries within that economy and within that industry identify or target based certain companies which are good for investments. We'll analyze which are good investment opportunities that is in company, that is top down. You're coming from economy, industry, and then company. Otherwise, the other way around is bottom approach. In a bottom approach, first company is analyzed, then the company is into particular industry, that industry and analyzed and that economy and macroeconomic factors are analyzed. There is also various types of analyst or research which is done, which is known as buy side and sell side research. Now, what is the sell side analyst do? Sell side analysts work for firms which actually provide investment banking, broking, advisory services for the client. They are actually publishing research reports for securities of certain stocks or companies or industries with specific recommendations like either to buy or hold or sell a particular security. These are sell-side analysts. Other way around, there are buy-side analysts who are working for the money managers. Now, money managers are like mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, portfolio managers. They are purchasing, buying and selling securities for their own investment accounts. These analysts are actually generating investment recommendations for their internal consumption, for their own portfolios. So this is buy-side analyst. This is a difference between buy-side and a sell-side analyst. So as we were talking about the process of fundamental analysis, idea is to identify the and certain factors, economy, industry, and company, analyze that, determine the intrinsic value of a stock, and then uh, take and give a recommendation or take a decision whether you want to buy or you want to sell the stock. So in the in the case, if market price is less than intrinsic value, the recommendation will come as buy. Uh, let's talk about economy analysis. Uh, so we'll uh, discuss from top-down perspective. Uh, let's discuss economy analysis first. So uh, macroeconomic factors uh, which is influencing almost all industries and companies within the industry, that is the economy factors. Uh, for example, there is monetary and fiscal policy. Let's take an example. Let's say in a fiscal policy initiative, there is a tax reduction. When tax reduction comes, it encourages spending, right? 
on the other way around if there is removal of subsidies or there is an additional tax which is imposed then it discourages spending similarly in monetary policy if there is a reduction of money supply economy is going to be uh, affecting the expansionary plans if there is a reduction in the uh, money supply whereas uh, other way around if there is a increase in money supply that is also going to impact the companies which want capital for their businesses for any uh, macro economic forecast that estimate should also be included estimates of certain variables in economy for example gdp gross domestic product inflation rate interest rate unemployment etc one of the most important thing which an analyst does is to watch out the release of various uh, these economic variables or statistics by the government for example they'll be looking at wpi and cpi indices of inflation they'll be looking at industrial production data they'll be looking at gdp growths they're analyzing those numbers understanding interest rate volatility how it is impacting different industries for example if there is a interest rate volatility it might impact more to a financial institution versus any other uh, industrial sector for example pharmaceutical might not get impacted by the interest rate change so <clears throat> economy and stock market also has a very strong and consistent relationship so uh, generally stock market is known as a leading indicator of econ leading economic indicator it means that uh, le what does a leading economic indicator means that it is a measure of economic recovery which actually moves first before that recovery has already come or will move faster than the economy so act because stock prices uh, reflect the expectation of a future economic and future economic and activity and not the past or the current activity so uh, economy analysis is about analyzing lot of macro data macro data points and understanding how it is impacting various industries and which industries might be in that particular economy cycle which industries uh, might get benefit out of it and then dive into the industry analysis there are various analysis which is done in industry as well we'll go into understanding industry life cycle first there are various stages in industry life cycle so there are four stages there is introduction st stage growth stage maturity stage and decline stage now in introduct in this uh, uh, introduction stage the uh, industry is new so therefore sale is modest not very good uh the profits might be very small or negligible they are very slow high development costs are there so introduction space uh, introduction uh, point of in industry is at this point where it is kind of young and where your profit margins are low because sales is also low modest and your might be expenses a little higher at, at this point of time after in the industry which has gone through the introduction phase they move into growth phase in a growth phase you might find so in the initial phase of the growth phase there might be less firms there will be new product which are getting introduced in the system there is less competition very high profits so uh, this stage is then followed by the maturity stage maturity phase is generally the longest phase of the life cycle of an industry in this stage actually the growth rate of industry is normally matching the economy growth rate the firms um, in this industry uh, are differing from each other maybe some company might be having a different cost structure than others they are able to control costs so different companies have a different structure when they when they are into maturity and competition is generally high during this period because there are many firms and profit margin is at normal level when the when a industry is nearing to the end of the maturity stage it moves into a decline or deceleration of growth stage generally we call it in this stage the sales is declining due to the shift of demand 
because demand is coming down that's how the sales is also getting negatively impacted and profit margins are under pressure some firms might see negative profits coming in, uh, in when they are in this uh, in this phase of the industry so uh, this is how four different stages are identified analysts try to look at various in uh, the industry and which stage it is uh, at trying to identify uh, what are the factors which might be impacting this industry other type of analysis which is done is understanding about the business cycle so when you look at the business cycle this is how it looks like there is a peak phase there is a contraction phase there is a pro phase which is at bottom and there is again after that there is an expansion phase so in this how it is done so if, for example uh, when we look at a peak phase peak phase is a time when your inflation is high and because demands are, demands are actually moved up more than the supply in this particular phase there are certain uh, industries which are having uh, pressure because of the prices are going up so some industries or some companies might have to increase the prices of their products also which might impact their competitive competitive structure but there are some industries like oil and metals where uh, inflation is not impacting much why because the uh, extraction of those materials might not get impacted because of inflation so these companies are able to increase their prices during these periods and they are able to get higher profit margins that's about the peak when uh, there is a peak on, on an economic cycle other phase is contraction contraction is uh, the time when the economy is towards the downturn in this type of uh, condition the defensive industries or defensive sectors are doing well generally do well so uh, like consumer staples pharmaceuticals fmcg they are generally outperforming by others why they outperform others because even though uh, in a contraction phase consumer spending power reduces they are not going for discretionary items but they might be going for necessities and these companies provide necessities one cannot cut the necessity so these sectors uh, perform better than uh, historically has performed better in contraction phase versus other sectors banking and financial sectors they perform at the end of this phase towards the end of this phase and there is a tro tro is um, something when uh, economy cycle hit the bottom after that recovery phase starts so there is initial period of recovery and then there is then it goes towards the peak so uh, this is a expansionary period for an economy in an expansionary period of an economy you will find companies which are using their uh, leverage better for example their degree of operating leverage or their financial leverage is better they do better in this time because they are able to produce higher for example uh, pr manufacturing companies of cars or personal computers refrigerators tractors okay etc uh, consumer durable sector this sector might perform better during recovery phase basically cyclical industries perform better and are attractive investment during the early stage of this period let's go into another analysis of industry which is known as porter's five forces model now porter's five forces model has five forces which is inherent in the model uh, so let's look at these five forces so there are forces your rivalry among the competitors within the industries so uh, these are the five forces on the screen first force is the industry competitors so yeah, industry competitors is analyzing understanding what is the competition level within the existing companies in that particular industry if there are many companies of similar size in the industry they generally their competition is very tough and the it is very high rivalry is increased during that time so they are actually uh, fighting very hard at a full capacity and it is very hard to sell so uh, how much is the level of com 
competition within the existing uh, players in that industry that is analyzed in the first component. Second component is the new entrants, the threat of new entrants. Now it depends on within the industry, how is the entry barriers of that industry? For example, if the cost of setting up a company in the industry is too high, that is a high entry barrier. It is not, uh, so in that industry, it's not easy for a new entrant to come. And when a new entrant come, it, uh, that particular entrant might influence the industry and their participants, their competition in a different way. Also, uh, it influences the future competitive structure of the industry. Also, it is impacting the profitability of the existing firms in the industry. You have various examples within Indian industries where whenever new competitors have entered or bigger players have entered in an existing firm, existing industry, uh, it has changed the dynamics of that industry. Third type of uh, parameter force is bargaining power of buyers. Now, buyers, if they have high power, they can influence the profitability. If they have the power and they are in a position to demand lower prices or better quality, then the comp then the competitive structure is completely different there. So, uh, in that situation, it's easier for a customer to switch from one company to another. So, it's a hard neck competition if the bargaining power of buyers is quite high. Then there is threat of substitutes. So if there is a uh, industry where substitutes can come easily, it is threat for that particular industry because if substitute come, the, the earlier products might, might lose their value. So greater the substitutability of the product, lower is the profitability margins because that substitute is eating away the profits of the existing firms. Last force in this is bargaining power of suppliers. If there are less and bigger suppliers in that particular industry, it is very powerful because they can influence the industry in a way by reducing quality of a product or increasing prices uh, when they are giving it to the industry. So they might impact it negatively if they are very few and large suppliers. They will have that bargaining power with the companies. So these five forces are analyzed in Michael uh, Porter's five forces model. So uh, this is about the industry analysis. Let's talk about company analysis. We are going top down. So let's talk about company analysis. Now we should understand one thing when you're talking about company analysis. Company analysis is different from stock valuation. Okay. Now company analysis try to understand company from a various uh, component perspective, for example, SWOT analysis uh, and various components. Once those components are analyzed, these are then, this analysis is used as an input to calculate the valuation of a company. So one should not uh, have this uh, thing in their mind that both are same, stock valuation and company analysis. Both are little different. Company analysis used as the input for stock valuation. So, however, it is an important step of calculating value of a firm. So, it is needed to determine the value of a stock. There are many components. So, in company analysis, first component is financial statement analysis. This is actually uh, one of the good, often used starting point for analyzing a company, looking at various statements like P&L statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, or looking at ratios of a company it means uh, when when our ratio is calculated and analyzed it gives a snapshot about how a company performance has been and these ratios should be looked at uh, with respect to the industry trend and the historical averages another important component of company analysis is SWOT analysis you would have heard about it SWOT analysis is strength weakness opportunity and threat analysis now strength and weakness is the internal strength and weakness of a company so it is intrinsic internal analysis of a company whereas your opportunity and threats are the external environment analysis of an industry for example a competitive advantage of a company might be considered as the internal factor so it is strength and weakness 
whereas uh, a particular policy on tax is an external environment which is impacting all the companies in the industry which is external if it is favorable it is an opportunity for a company for that particular industry so uh, as well as for a company other type of component is your competitive strategies now there are various types of competitive strategies to if you uh, define it into two major parts this is either defensive or it is aggressive what is a defensive competitive strategy so there is a competition in the industry there these competitive forces are impacting that company a company which is using its capabilities to deflect those forces that is a defensive strategy you are trying to deflect the competitive competition forces whereas a company when they use their own strengths to affect the competition competitive forces they are using aggressive strategy these are two different types of strategies here other than that there are two more strategies given by michael porter suggested it is cost leadership and differentiation in a cost leadership a company or a firm might be looking at becoming a cost leader of industry they might be selling lowest uh, cost product in that industry so they are becoming leader there other way around a company might be trying to identify themselves as a differentiated form so they might position themselves as giving something unique to their existing or their clients or their customers so they are using they are differentiating themselves within the industry that is differentiation industry last component is business model now business model it's about it's one of the most important step of company analysis most important component now in this component an analyst uh try to answer various questions uh, related to business model of a company for example what does a company do how does it do it uh, what are the various customers in this uh, company who are these customers and who is buying products and services of this company why are they buying this customer this products and services of this company how does a company is serving their customers do i understand this business well so trying to understand what is the model of that particular company different companies have different models every company has a unique way of doing their business so trying to find out the efficiency with which the products and services are produced they are delivered to the customer and it is different from company to company so it is very imperative for a analyst to understand entire business model of a company then comes the intrinsic value calculation estimation now um uh, price and value are completely two different concepts in investing so uh so price is available price is something which is reflecting in the current market price of the stock but value is based on analysis and evaluation and it is also uh, you have to compare value and price so various approaches are there to valuations and there are a lot of uncertainties which are associated with it because there are uh inputs which are estimated also while you are calculating valuations so uh, when an analyst is analyzing or uh, the estimating the intrinsic value it actually requires combination of knowledge experience and professional judgment in arriving that fair uh, valuation of an asset it is kind of an educated estimate it's always an estimate if it is a if you are calculating the uh, intrinsic value so it is estimate of intrinsic value so in a case uh, so there are various models one of the most uh, known model and most most appropriate model in a case where you know the cash flows which uh, the company might be receiving in future what are the various stream of cash flows which might be coming when are they coming what is the timing of the cash flows and what is the rate of return investors are expecting from those cash flows if that is known then dcf or discounted cash flow approach or valuation is the most appropriate approach so three factors one has to know so we are discussing discounted cash flow here if these three things are known then the uh, dcf valuation is opted now investor would be willing to pay uh, uh potential investor might be willing to pay pay some amount for those expected cash flows which are going to come in future for a period of time these cash flows uh when that the cash flows which are analyzed and estimated these might be outflows and inflows also so 
the rational way to find the value of the business is simply to find what are the various inflows and outflows at various time at various point of time and then you discount it to the particular discounting rate determine that rate discount it and discount it to a present value so you try to find out what are the various outflows and inflows of cash flows and you discount it to the present value and that present value is then the value or the intrinsic value of the firm so two principal factors are actually estimate are used in calculating valuation of a firm in dcf so first is estimating the cash flows and other is determining the rate at which you are discounting those cash flows both are important so uh, cash flows are important so cash flows uh, uh, there are two ways to look at the cash flows actually when i am talking about cash flows talking about free cash flows what are free cash flows so let's say a company earns a profit they have uh, after paying uh, certain expenses and expense uh, certain expenses in a particular time period so there is profit left out that is a earning which is available for a common investor however uh, there are uh, other parameters also which which can be added or reduced from those earnings which might give you a free cash flow data so free cash flow is how much cash flow is available for the investors be it a debt investor or a capital investor or both investors how much is it available after paying the expenses of that particular period and whatever capital uh, for maintaining the uh, capital assets uh, the cost which is there reducing that and reducing the expenses expenses what cash is left out at the end that is free cash flow now free cash flow is calculated in, there are two types of free cash flows so you have free cash flow to firm and free cash to equity what does free cash flow to firm mean so uh, the free cash flows which are available before the payment of any debt outstanding which is taken into consideration that is free cash flow to firm uh if you look at equity holders so uh, cash flows dividends are not the only cash flows which will come or which is for the equity investors so whatever earnings are there if you reduce the interest payments or debt is deducted from p cash flow uh, and the borrowings is deducted after that what is left out is actually the free cash flow available for investors so uh, if we look at the formula of how the free cash flow firm is so this is the earnings earning before interest and tax so you reduce the tax component add the non cash expense now depreciation what is depreciation when you bought a particular uh, fixed asset or uh, in this case uh, tangible asset it is depreciated over a period of time now depreciation is then uh, is is a component as an expense in a pnl statement however when a depreciation is there in a pnl statement as an expenses actually though money is not going out cash flow is not going out that's why it is added back so any non cash expense which is there in a pnl statement is then added back because actual cash is not going out and then then increase on then you reduce the increase in working capital or you decrease the in uh, the working capital okay so you reduce the increase in the working capital or it, or you add the decrease in the working capital and then you reduce the capital expenditure which is because of the sale of an asset when you do this you come to a number called p cash flow to firm free cash flow to equity is calculated from free cash flow to firm so from free cash flow to firm you reduce the interest component and the add the net borrowing then the free cash flow to equity comes in place so uh, this this is about the first component of the dcf is about the cash flows these are the cash flows now comes to the second part second part is at what rate should should one discount these cash flows to come to the valuation of a company so uh, in that case there are certain models uh, which are used in this case for estimating value of equity cost of equity is calculated by using your kpm model that is capital asset pricing model for discounting free cash flow to firm weighted average cost of capital is used for uh, 
डिस्काउंटिंग फ्री कैश फ्लो टू इक्विटी कॉस्ट ऑफ इक्विटी इज यूज ठीक है एंड कॉस्ट ऑफ इक्विटी इज कैलकुलेटेड बाई कैपिटल एसेट प्राइसिंग मॉडल तो कैपिटल एसेट प्राइसिंग मॉडल इन विच कॉस्ट ऑफ इक्विटी इज इक्वल टू रिस्क फ्री रेट प्लस बीटा मल्टीप्लाइड बाय मार्केट रिस्क प्रीमियम व्हाट इज मार्केट रिस्क प्रीमियम द मार्केट रिटर्न माइनस द रिस्क फ्री रेट इज द मार्केट रिस्क प्रीमियम सो दिस इज आल्सो नोन एज द रिक्वायर्ड रेट ऑफ रिटर्न कॉस्ट ऑफ इक्विटी इज आल्सो नोन एज द रिक्वायर्ड रेट ऑफ रिटर्न एंड देन दिस इज कैलकुलेटेड एंड एफसीएफई दैट इज फ्री कैश फ्लो टू इक्विटी इज डिस्काउंटेड बाय कॉस्ट ऑफ इक्विटी सो एफसीएफई इज यूज्ड हाउएवर let's say your company has a uh, negative earnings negative eps negative data uh, and the cap or the capital structure is about to change in future at that time point of time free cash flow to firm is used uh, for discounting free cash flow to firm uh, uh, vac or weighted average cost of capital is used now this is the formula of weighted average cost of capital cost of equity multiplied by weight of equity plus cost of debt which is after tax multiplied by weight of debt now cost of equity is calculated by capital asset pricing model and uh, your cost of debt is actually the debt which is prevailing interest rate in the economy of the comparable credit quality that particular rate can be taken or the rate at which the company has the net borrowing or the borrowing of a company that rate can be taken as a cost of debt what is weight of equity it means how much in total capital there is equity similarly what is weight of debt how much is debt in total capital so let's understand it this by using an example let's say the, let's say there is a company which has a beta of 1.25 risk free rate is 6% and market risk premium of the country is 9% how do you calculate the cost of equity uh, using kpm model so what is kpm model you use required return or cost of equity is uh, required return or cost of equity is equal to risk free rate plus beta multiplied by market risk premium in this case risk free rate is 6% to 6% plus beta beta is 1.25 that is market risk multiplied by market risk premium which is 9% for that country so you put that all that in the formula and you get the cost of equity or required rate of return how do you calculate vac right? let's take an example let's say the market value of equity is 30 lakhs market or the value of a debt is 20 lakhs what will be the total capital total capital will be 50 lakhs that is equity plus debt which will be the total capital cost of equity in this case is 4% cost of debt is 6% tax rate is 35% so how do you cal calculate weightage average cost of capital cost of equity is given you just need to calculate weight of equity cost of debt is given tax rate is given you just need to calculate weight of debt now what is weight of debt it is debt in total capital now total capital is 50 lakhs so 20 lakhs divided by 50 lakhs that is 2 by 5 is debt weight in equity it is 30 lakhs divided by 50 lakhs which is 3 by 5 which is equity weight you put all that in the formula you get this weighted average cost of capital so you can uh, this uh, examples will help you understand how the calculation can be done there are other valuation model also other than dcf there is asset based valuation and relative valuation asset based valuation is generally for industries which are very asset oriented for example your real estate shipping aviation they have higher fixed assets into them so uh, that can be used by valuing the business is equal to assets minus liabilities relative valuation is basically identifying certain variables or uh, identifying certain comparable firms and then calculating uh, their uh, ratios and comparing them so there are various ratios which are used in relative valuation let's look at those ratios first ratio we are talking about is price to earning what is price to earning that is simply current market price divided by the eps right now uh, uh, this can be calculated as historical trailing pe or forward pe 
how do you do that when you are calculating p in your denominator you have eps if in a denominator you use past one year last four quarters of eps that is your historical or trailing period if you use projected next one year eps next one uh, one year that is four quarters of eps that is your forward or leading pe so two different types of pe so how does pe number what does tell oh, pe number tells you pe number actually tell you whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued in comparison to industry and a stock let's say there is a P, there is a company which has a pe of 10 what does this 10 mean it means that for uh, investor is willing to pay 10 rupees for every 1 rupee earning of a company now uh, that again itself doesn't make sense unless you compare it with industry pe and historical pe and the peers pe then you uh, compare and you find out if the pe is higher than the industry or the peers you will say it is overvalued if it is lower than the industry historical or the and the peers you will say it is undervalued so P ratio also needs to be calculated on a constant basis because you can see the uh, uh, numerator is current market price. It keeps on changing. So you have to use relevant P for calculating that. Next ratio is price to book value. There are times when uh, the companies are not profitable. So their earnings will be negative. So if it is a negative P, you will not be able to use P E ratio. So there, for that, there is price to book value. In this price to book value, current market price is not divided by EPS, but divided by the book value per share. Book value is derived from the balance sheet of a company. Uh, now, balance sheet has assets which are at historical prices, less their depreciation. So in few industries, it might not be relevant to use price to book value to calculate whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued. Right? So, uh, for example, uh, if a company's stock price is lower than its book value, it will indicate two things. Uh, in a first thing, if a stock is being incorrectly undervalued, if the valuation, because these are all estimates, if the uh, stock is being incorrectly undervalued by uh, the investors, they represent that it is an attra attractive buying opportunity and it is a very good bargain price at which they can buy. On the other hand, if the company is correctly valued in the opinion of investor, then it may be a kind of a losing proposition. So, so there are two ways to looking at looking at how the uh, valuation is valued. It is correctly valued or it is incorrectly valued. It is as I said. It since the book value is a historical cost of assets. And there are certain industries which might not, it might not be relevant for those industries where you do not have market value of those assets. So use of uh, price to book value is limited. However, certain industries like your banks and financial institutions where you can get assets at market value, price to book value makes sense. Third type of ratio is price to sales. Now price to sales is similar in the nature of PE or price to book value. Why? Because it also tells you whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued. However, there are certain investors, they might feel that earnings can be manipulated. And since all of these are um, estimates, it can be manipulated also by on the PNL statement. So uh, why not look at sales data? Because sales data is less prone to man uh, manipulation. In those cases, uh, generally price to sales is used then there is price earnings to growth ratio it is also known as peg peg ratio in short so this ratio is actually is one step superior than you than your price to earning ratio so uh, this is this ratio may be used to express the extent to which the price that an investor is willing to pay for a company whether it is justified by the growth of the earnings. So assumption is generally when somebody is buying a high PE stock, they say that because this particular company or this particular stock in future might give you higher returns, that's why we are buying this higher PE stock. Even though it is overvalued, I'm buying it. How do you uh, 
चेक इट वेदर यू आर बाइंग करेक्ट स्टॉक और नॉट क्योंकि यूज पेग रेशियो टू चेक वट इज द डिग्री ऑफ रिलायबिलिटी ऑफ दोज ग्रोथ एजम्पन सो थम रूल इज इफ द पेग रेशियो इज वन इट मीन्स दैट द मार्केट इज वैल्यूइंग एज पर द स्ट्रॉन्ग स्टॉक एस्टिमेटेड ईपीएस ग्रोथ रेट इफ इट इज लेस देन वन इट मीन्स दैट ईपीएस ग्रोथ इज पोटेंशियली इट माइट सरप्राइज द मार्केट करेंट वैल्यूएशन एंड स्टॉक इज अंडर वैल्यूड ऑन द अदर हैंड इज पेग रेशियो इज अपोजिट टू दैट मीन्स हायर देन वन इट मीन्स इट इज ओवर वैल्यूड so this is how you interpret peg ratio also then comes your economic value added economic value added is measuring the true economic profit of produced by a company it is also known as economic profit how do you calculate it you multiply invested capital by cost of capital in percentage terms reduce after tax net operating profit then you arrive at economic value added another uh, ratio is market value added how do you calculate it you calculate the current market value minus the original capital which is contributed by the uh, uh, investors and if it is positive it means the company has added value to the investors if it is negative it means original capital contributed is higher than what is the current market value it means it is destroyed value that is eva mva other multiple is uh, ebit by ev ev by ebit now what is ev in this case ev is enterprise value what is what does enterprise value tell you it tells you that if you want to buy a company today if you want to buy the entire company how much money is required that is enterprise value so enterprise value is calculated by adding market capitalization total debt and reduce all the cash and cash equivalents that's how you calculate the enterprise value so uh, enterprise value can be compared with the earnings as you can see ebit is the earnings ebitda is the earnings so this is ebitda multiple and this is ebit by ev so you are actually checking how much times ebit is to enterprise value if it is higher the better so uh, this uh, higher ratio can give you a uh, higher ratio is actually telling the company is valued high in perception of the market participants okay this particular ratio enterprise value to ebitda this is higher the better this is actually telling you whether it is from market participant perception whether it is overvalued or undervalued then you have enterprise value to sales also so how much how many times enterprise value is to sales let's look at how the uh, comparison of uh, dcf and relative valuation is now discounted cash flow model is uh, just now we uh, looked at discounted cash flow model it is actually estimating your intrinsic value of a stock whereas relative valuation where we see lot of ratios it is determining the value of that particular economic entity and you are comparing those particular entities so discounted cash flow is actually dependent on growth of the cash flows and and there is an estimate of the discount rate with which you discount those cash flows and bring it to the present value relative relative valuation uh, compare the stock price to the relevant valuables variables like you have stock value earnings cash flow book value etc if we go deeper if you try to understand these two techniques you will find that uh these relative valuation multiples are just the simplified version of dcf let's look at an example let's look at pe ratio now pe ratio uh is actually comparing the price to the earnings which the company is generating so it is a fundamental concept that the value of a asset is the present value of its future return which is coming in so value is reflected by the current market price right so uh the, the ratio is also influenced by the same variable that influence the value under the discounted cash flow techniques there is another ratio where you calculate the price by dividends right price is equal to the next period dividend divided by expected <clears throat> discount rate minus expected growth rate so if you divide uh, this formula by next 
period's earnings you will get price to earnings of next period by d1 by e1 and k minus g now what does it telling you p ratio is getting impacted by two variables these are the two variables there is k and g so what is k k is the expected uh, k is the discount rate and g is the expected dividend growth rate so higher the expected growth rate of dividends higher would be the p ratio and higher is the required rate of uh, return of the equity lower is the p ratio so this gives an idea of comparability of relative valuation and dcf one can also use this formula to calculate price of the company so let's say in this case uh, if we calculate intrinsic value a stock dividend is expected to grow at constant rate what will be the intrinsic value for stock if the dividend next period dividend is rupees 3 k is 9% and g is 6% g is the growth of the dividend and k is the required return of equity so we put that in formula p is equal to d1 divided by k minus g d1 is the next period dividend 3 divided by your 9% required return minus the dividend growth rate 9 minus 6 so 3 divided by 0 0.03 that is rupees 100 so even the uh, intrinsic value can be calculated using this formula just like a terminal value is calculated now let's look into what is technical analysis so uh, in fundamental analysis it's about analyzing financials non financial data uh, looking at economic factors looking at industry and then calculating the intrinsic value however when you look at technical analysts they do not care to analyze these fundamentals of the business idea is to forecast the direction of the prices by studying the patterns of the chart which is created by price and volume data so uh, technical analysts believe that the uh, uh, this market activity will generate indicators in price trend itself which can be used to forecast the direction and magnitude of the stock price movement which is happening so technical analyst is based on the assumption that all the information which is which can affect the performance of the stock uh, the company fundamentals, economic, market sentiment are already reflected in the stock prices. So they completely miss out. They do not do that step of analyzing the intrinsic value. However, they use the price and volume data to look at the price charts and certain patterns in the chart. Analyze how these, uh, uh, find out those indicators which can help to analyze how the prices might move in future. Both analysis fundamental and technical analysis are using estimates both analysis are trying to find out whether you should buy the stock sell the stock or hold the stock at a particular time period so in technical analysis uh, there are three things understand for to understand the price behavior what is the past prices of a particular stock how the trend of this past prices is how much is the volume so after the price chart is there there are certain Patterns which can be identified under technical analysis. Whether that pattern is backed by the volumes in the trading and for what time period that particular pattern is there. There are a lot of uh, things which can be seen in technical analysis. For example, there are various trends. You see there are upward trend, downward trend, sideways trend. So idea is of uh, technical analysis that a stock will be in a trend unless there is a unless there uh, something is broken and there is a reverse in those trends. So uh, there are certain support and resistance level also. Let's say a stock is nearing resistance level. What, how will you infer uh, from technical analysis uh, point of view? If a stock is nearing resistance level, it means one should either book the profits because it is nearing resistance level and historically it has come down from resistance level. Other way to look at it is, is if resistance level is broken along with the uh, volume data and price goes up then the conditions have changed now a new trend has evolved that's how the resistance and support levels are looked at 
so there is an upward trend and downward trend which are accompanied by the strong volumes uh technical analyst actually converting this data into chart as i talked about these charts can be line charts bar charts candlestick charts uh patterns are identified trying to identify triggers for buying and selling a particular stock also if you look at uh, various indicators there are trend line indicators moving averages bollinger band analysis so uh, moving averages you might have 10 5 10 30 50 100 200 days moving averages or you have bollinger band where you uh, trying to figure out whether you should buy or if it is going uh uh deviating from your moving average how much it is deviating with what probability it is deviating from that particular moving average that is the bollinger band analysis so there are various analysis which is done in technical analysis also and we have just talked about fundamental analysis that's it from this chapter point of view